Looking up King Street from the bull stake, showing the many shops on both sides of the street, all with their own share of customers. There were at least six butcher shops in King Street alone at this time. The post box bottom right replaced an earlier one set into the wall of the greengrocer's shop just out of sight. Pinfold Street again, the shops on the right started out as miners' cottages and the tenants were amongst victims of the cholera in the early 18th century, later converted to shops. Note the tram lines in the centre of the road. This shop was in King Street and shows members of the Morton family. It was still Morton's Cake Shop up until the shop was closed and demolished, still run by family members, maybe the two children in this photograph. This is a family outside a shop in King Street, early part of the 1900s. Note the long white aprons worn by the two assistants on the right. This became Nan Bailey's shop and the door on the left was where the family lived. Location of this shop is largely unknown but could be on the corner of Bilston Street on the opposite corner to Bob Smith's favourite house emporium. Farquhar's shop in Pinfold Street stood next to the Ocean Fish Bar and like many others in the 1960s it was demolished and the gap where it stood is still there. Note the old gas lamp above the window. Macmillan's, location unknown, but obviously a bustling shop. Could it have been the forerunner to Bishops and Marsden's, a later business in the same building in Church Street? Lowe's Butcher's Shop, corner of Victoria Road and King Street. Lucy Lowe stands in the doorway, circa 1920s. Now a sandwich shop. We are now in Church Street, outside Bishops and Marsdens, opposite St Joseph's Catholic Church. Men's Outfitters to the left, Household Goods to the right. Mr Marsden is the suited gentleman in the centre. By the traffic lights opposite St Lawrence Way in Pinfold Street. Mr Boynton is in a suit and wearing a hat, a public spirited businessman noted for his ox roasts on civic occasions. A more modern view of Farquhar's shop. Note that the old lamp over the window has gone. The Black Horse pub yard lies behind the gates. The gap left when the shop was demolished is still there today. The top of King Street, the White Lion pub at bottom right behind the market stalls in the fold. Billingsley's shop next on the right. This building stands today. Stanbury's Outfitters is centre right and next is the Dog and Partridge about the 1920s. The opposite view, the rectory gardens are top centre, Underwood's shoe shop on the right, Smart's bakery horse and cart outside. Middle of King Street in the 1950s, Littlewoods is now the Coral Leisure Outlet and Perfection Fireplaces is now a flower shop, bouquets. The other side of King Street, early 1960s, Outside original Boots Chemist, John Sutton is seen on the left talking to a friend, corner of High Street, also known as Cock Street. Did, did cockfighting take place there? Looking down King Street to the bull stake, showing more destruction of the old town in the early 1960s, Phillips Chemist stands a few doors down from Boots. Top of King Street at the junction with Church Street. The Fold and White Lion are behind the van. Timothy White was one of the ke three chemists in King Street and the car is a Ford Anglia. An overall view of a thriving King Street. By this time a one-way street. The entire left-hand side and into Pinfold Street to the corner of St Lawrence Way is now Asda's car park. The exception is Lloyd's Bank, William Hills and the Library. Some of the buildings on the right still stand. Top of King Street, 
Note the no-entry road markings because of the one-way ruling which has had been introduced at this time. The Dog and Partridge is the tall white building on the right. Close up of the popular Dan and Grossman shop which stood on the corner of King Street and High Street, the forerunner to the small supermarket style of shopping we know so well today. The site of the present library, note a glimpse of the replica bull stake, lower left. Bull baiting took place on the bull stake itself and hence the name. Middleton's was run by two sisters and replaced Apple Yard's haberdashery shop. How many remember the cuckoo clock and how the customer's money was whizzed across to the cashier who whizzed the change back on a wire across the shop from end to end. A view from the bull stake up King Street showing the beginnings of modernization birmingham midshires is on the right the sad decline of a once thriving king street lloyd's bank building is top left Looking down to the bull stake, the Three Horseshoes pub on the left. Bustling customers are starkly conspicuous by their absence. The beginning of the end of the old town. One car where not so long ago there had been many. Hard to believe, but this photo was taken on a weekday. Underwood's well-known shoe shop on the right. The manager for many years, Fred Sutton, eventually married Mrs. Underwood. The opening to Darleston's Market is next door on the right. The front of the club card for Underwood's shop. A once familiar club card, many families would pay for their goods a little at a time, known sometimes as having things on the never-never, a forerunner to the credit cards of today. Grocery was often put on the slate and paid for out of wages at the end of the week. A billhead for a Mrs. Burns, dated 22nd July 1968. Two pairs of shoes for £3, 12 shillings and 10 pence, approximately £3.65 pence today for two pairs. Allen's Butcher Shop on the corner of King Edward Street and Finfall Street. Again, Mr. Allen was a public spirited shop owner who was justly proud of the Darleston of his day. Note the blocks of flats towering above the shop. These were built in the 1960s and now demolished. A sweeping view of Pinfall Street in the early 1960s.
These ladies help run the tea room and are very happy with their newly modernised kitchen. They are Catherine Ward holding the kettle, Joan by the way, the Reverend Derek Chambers with Vicky Ward looking on. Sheila Bennett, Gwen Large, Catherine Ward, Audrey Corter, Joan by the way, and Brenda Shaw. This shows Noreen Hunt, Betty Sanders, and Sheila Bennett, who are all regulars at the Copper Kettle. Seated at the table are second from left, Joyce Reese, Gordon Shaw, and Arthur Causa. This gives a good indication of how popular the copper kettle has become. In the background is the serving hatch from the kitchen, with Audrey and Arthur Causa, amongst others, helping themselves to milk and sugar and other goodies from the table. Seated at this table are a group of visitors. These are still more visitors, all helping to make the Copper Kettle a popular and well-used venue on Tuesday mornings. More regulars now from the church congregation. They are Millie, Margaret, Irene, Betty, Gwen Large, Sue and Jean. And still holding the copper kettle is Catherine Ward. This is the dedication of the tapestry at All Saints Church on 17th May 1975. John Ridyard, the vicar, walks with the Bishop of Lichfield in the church procession. Here we can see Arthur Clamp, Iris Lawson, Mrs S Lloyd, Mrs Jones, Arthur Smith, Harry Daniels, Harry Bowden, Will Jeffs, Harry Pugh, John Ridyard and the Bishop and the choir procession lines up outside the church ready for the service. This is the actual dedication of the tapestry. All Saints is like the phoenix rising out of the ashes. The old church was blown into the sky by one of Hitler's bombs in 1942 and the church we see today was built in the early 1950s. The church ladies spent many, many hours stitching this lovely tapestry. Now we have the Sunday School Festival in Cope Street, June 1975, with the Brigade Band, Church Girls Brigade, Cubs and Scouts. The new Sunday School banner was given in memory of Joe Foster. Members of the Mother's Union, there's Mary Foster and Francis Knowles at the back. The choir and Glenn Bailey, David Stanley, Stanley Bowden, Harry da Daniels and Alan Pugh. This is the procession coming out of Gordon Street and going along the Warsaw Road. Here we see John Caddy with members of the choir and Len Bailey. The procession coming up the Warsaw Road to go back into the church at the end of a very hot day. This is Civic Sunday when Henry Ashbury was Mayor of Warsaw. Cliff Peach is there wearing his medals. Darleston Girl Guides. 
Brigade Marching Unit, Girls Brigade, Darleston Worthies, The tall man with spectacles is PJ Stanley and Mr Williams is with him, a teacher at the grammar school. Arthur Webb brings up the rear. Here we have the Reverend Brynmore Jones and the church wardens. Henry Silbury and Cathy Ashbury lead the march past the Darleston Town Hall. All Saints Brigade Band leads this procession. Then comes the Territorials. Regimental Association, British Legion, Brigade Company and Church Girls Brigade passing in front of the Town Hall. This is the occasion when Princess Margaret came to Rubri Owens. The lady on the bike is Violet Ford. The Princess's car is coming up King Street into Church Street and this was in 1962. A trip now in an Izetta bubble car with Tony and Jean Jordan, again in 1962. Going up Bentley Lane past the Boat Pub, past Bradley and Foster's on the right and the old sewerage beds also on the right. Approaching the crossroads at Bentley, the blue bus from Warsaw just passing. Into Edinburgh Avenue with the Emmanuel Church on the hill. Left into Churchfield Road, into Attley Road, and on into Ewart Road. Looking out of the police station window in Crescent Road to the Sons of Rest, in Victoria Park. That building is still there today but stands derelict. A glimpse there of Bob Smith's but now into Camp Hill. Lowe's, Lowe's Seed Shop is the white building centre left. A beer dray making a delivery to the Labour Club. Now a steam train pulling into James Bridge Station. Anyone recognise themselves amongst these ladies? or a relative perhaps. It was obviously a ladies only outing. The train now pulling out of the station and into history.
Darleston Carnival, 1979. A sizeable and colourful procession along Church Street and into King Street, which was a one-way street by this time, but the procession was granted special permission to travel down to Pinfold Street on Carnival Day. Note that many of the shops were still flourishing at this time. Many of the floats were sponsored by the still thriving industries and the lorries were mostly provided by Hartshorn's Trans Transport Company whose works were on the lays. There were many kazoo bands and Herbert's Park became their venue for the annual kazoo band competition. And the events went on for two days. Eliminations were carried out on Carnival Day and the final was on the Sunday. This is the service float which was called Rocket into the 80s and won an award at the Lord Mayor's Show in London and came first in the Birmingham Lord Mayor's Show. An early view of the bull stake taken by Lane Bailey from his bedroom window. The wagon and horses on the right hand side. This was Wallace's shop opposite Len Bailey's selling sweets, tobacco and was also the booking office for Mason's coaches. This is Billy Winfindale's first shop in Wolverhampton Street, just off Catherine's Cross. Bill opened the shop way back in 1946 after being demobbed from the army on 31st December 1945. He was a qualified electrician by trade, which stood him in good stead for the business. He started by selling domestic appliances, furniture, carpets, radios, television, black and white of course, and toys, but he specialised in cycles as in those early days, everyone had a cycle of some sort. Bill had a large selection of bikes to choose from in the shop. Comrade made in Darleston, Robin Hood, New Hudson, Coventry Eagle, Wherewell, and Rally, just a few to mention. At Christmas time, Gwen, his wife, would decorate the shop. Christmas was the busiest time of the year, preparing the cycles for the Christmas rush. Bill ran a first-class repair service, and he also carried a large selection of parts for the cycles. The shop closed in February 2005 after 49 years service to the people of Darleston.
Darlaston Town Football Club, Birmingham Junior League Champions, season 1907 to 1908. The previous season, Darlaston had finished runners-up in the Warsaw and District League. The Birmingham Junior League later became known as the Birmingham Combinations. Darlaston Green Rovers, season 1922 to 23. In this photo, you see James Fieldhouse seated in the centre of the front row with the ball. Blockhall Rangers Football Club, season 1919 to 1920. We have been unable to trace the names and background of this team, but hope you will enjoy looking at them and perhaps even identifying some. Rubri Owen Football Club, season 1918 to 1919. Winners of the Silversmith Cup and runners-up in the Birmingham Works League, Base Vars and the Wensbury Cup. Imperial Works football team, 1922 to 1923. The location of this photo is unknown. Slater Street Methodist Football Club, season 1932 to 1933. Darlaston FC winners, Birmingham Combination, Tillotson Cup and Wensbury Charity Cup, season 1937 to 1938. Here we have another unknown photograph of players. We believe this is an early photograph of Darlaston Football Club. The date and names are unknown but it's an interesting photograph in itself. GKN 1930 to 1931, League Champions. Rubri Owens football season, 1931 to 32, winners of the Wensbury Amateur League, HG Williams Cup, Albion Shield, and Wensbury Charity Junior Cup. James Bridge Amateurs Football Club, season 1923 to 24. Top row, extreme left, is William Allen. Woden Works Football Club, 1935 to 1936. GKN Works Team, but we have no further information or the names of the players. Another GKN, first 11, 1956 to 1957. GKN, 1955 to 1956 apprentices. This photograph was taken in the snow. GKN, first 11s, 1957 to 1958. Our late goalkeeper, Bassett, Hardwick, Powell, Rathbone and Smith. GKN Junior Work Season 1954 to 1955. This Darlaston photograph was taken on the 9th of December, but we have no further information. A team of over 35s from Wellman Smith Owen taken in 1961. Normalised Bolts, 1961 again. Smith, Haywood, Walters, Hartsorn, Glover, Powell, Chambers, Hardwick, Smith, Fellows, Hunt, Horton and Dunton. Another unknown photo. We think this was taken outside the Victoria Pub, Warsaw Road, with Brian Stain back row. Garrington's Interdepartmental Football Team, 1970. Peter Wright, Kevin Small, Albert Southall, Jack Heath, Ray Shaw, Ray Foster and John Harvey. Darlaston Amateurs, 1956-1957. Edgar, Martin, 
Bow, Salisbury, Hall, Derrick Foster, Fellows, Longmore, Houston, Hartshorn, Southam and Morgan. League winners, Albion Shield League Cup, Wolverhampton League Cup and Wensbury Charity Cup Finals. Darleston Amateurs 1955-1956 Edgar, Routley, Southam, Bow, Salisbury, Hartshorn, Foster, Fellows, Longmore, Hewson, Robinson, Richards and Morgan. An unknown football team taken at George Rose Park. Note the old pumping station in the background. Glynwen FC foot winners of the Wolverhampton Works League Cup 1969-70 taken we believe at Charles Richards Sports Ground. Metro Camel Old Park Football Club Birmingham Works League winners of the Soho Shield. Darleston Boys Youth Club 1959, Bailey, Bentley, Lawrence, Jones, Brown, Dangerfield, James, Barry, Shaw, Kevin Brooks, Mick Vincent. Darleston FC 1953-1954. This team photo was taken at Herbert, Herbert's Park Road. This photo could be Darleston Labour Club in their striped kit. This photograph was taken at Darleston Football Ground. It could be a charity match. Darleston Birmingham Senior Cup winners taken at the city ground. Councillor Arthur Bissell holding the cup at Darleston Rec, Walter Smith and Bill Jones in attendance. Arthur Bissell now presenting the cup to Brian Carter. Brian Carter holds the cup and the little lad looks on, happy to be a winner. Ladies football team, Brenda by the way and team line up for photo shoot after the match. The team were trained by Kath and Ken Bailey and are seen here wearing their green and white strip. Again, the ladies football team, goalkeeper Brenda by the way, Dorothy Rowe, Lorna Purcell, Beryl Butler, Margaret Harrison, Joan Fryer, Margaret Bliss, Rhoda Hall, Anne Edgar and Eileen Corns in their blue and white strip. Knocking off time for committee member Harold Stevenson in 1994. Ralph Taylor was physiotherapist for Darleston and Lions Sports Sunday team for many years. Gil Priest has been involved with Darleston FC for almost 30 years, during which time he has been manager, chairman, treasurer and groundsman. Darleston Football Club, sponsored by Rubrio in 1995 to 2000. Brian Leather, Colin Johnson with David Owen of Rubrio Owen.
reign of Queen Victoria and the short reign of King Edward VII, we come to June 1911 and the coronation of King George V. This enormous bonfire was one of many lit across the country as part of the celebrations. Three years after this event saw the outbreak of the Great War, which was to further advance the slaughter of soldiers and civilians to industrial proportions, with the widespread use of machine guns, poison gas, tanks and war from the air. The Zeppelins initially struck fear into the people when they first dropped bombs on Britain. Ted Rhodes, who was seven at the time, recalls the Zeppelin air raid when bombs were dropped that damaged Russell Steelworks in Wensbury. Having witnessed this phenomenon, he, along with his friend Ian, ran away in the direction of Dorliston as fast as the legs would carry them. Another Zeppelin attack in Warsaw resulted in the death of the mayoress of Warsaw, who was killed when a bomb blast hit the tram in which she was a passenger. These gunlock workshops relate to what in the 18th and 19th centuries was an important trade centred in Darleston. By the time of the Great War, apart from some repair work to the loose machine guns, the gun trade was all but over, with work limited to the sporting and shotgun field and the manufacture of parts for the Birmingham gun trade. Perhaps the last gun maker in Darleston was Albert Tonks, whose workshop was near to Vinegar Hill, Rough A. Albert relocated his business to the Cannock Chase area when Rough A was redeveloped for housing. Shown here are some of the hammer gun locks, a side lock and a back action lock, with other gun furniture made in Darleston workshops. Here we see the side lock action shown fitted to a double barrel shotgun. And here is shown the back action lock similarly fitted to a double barrel shotgun. This picture shows gun collector Stan Orme on the left and Albert Tonks, gun maker and repairer on the right. This photograph was taken in later years at Albert's Cannock Chase premises. Moving on to 1929 and the coming of age of Mr. A.G.B. Owen, we see a tableau in the form of a birthday cake made by Darleston artist and sign writer Albert Peters. This was the centrepiece at the celebrations for Mr. A.G.B. Owen's 21st birthday. Entertainment at the party, given by his parents, Mr. and Mrs. A. Owen, was provided by Charles Till, Raymond Green, Charles Hedges, W.G. Cliff and the Works Orchestra. The Ruby Owen Company featured greatly for decades in the life of the town and its people, with some 7,000 jobs at the Darleston work at its peak. It was reckoned that everyone either worked for Ruby Owen or had a relative that did. The company was to become a major producer for the war effort in the years to come. 1935 and time again for celebrations with the Silver Jubilee of King George V and Queen Mary. Once again, great bonfires were erected across the country. This magnificent pyre was Darleston's contribution along with the street parties to the festivities. This is the bonfire now well ablaze. The popular site for such events was Glover's Mound or the Black Bonk, situated near to the public swimming baths. Later, the Black Bonk was to be host to a lookout post as the ensuing war grew ever nearer. Shortly after the Jubilee of King George V, he died and Prince Edward acceded to the throne. But before his coronation, he abdicated rather than give up his partner, Wallace Simpson. The crowd then went to his younger brother, the Duke of York, who became King George VI. After only a short time, king and country were embroiled in the Second World War, which would involve the civilian population as never before. This set of six photographs are of the visit by the king and queen to the GKN Darleston Works. The war effort by the manufacturing industry was of major importance, and visits such as this by the great and the good demonstrated the total commitment needed from all. Amongst other items, the GKN company was one of the major producers of nuts and bolts, which were needed in their millions for the construction of everything from an air raid shelter to an aircraft carrier. 
These conducted factory tours were an important part of the propaganda war to boost the morale of the local population and the workforce in particular, since more than ever the outcome of hostilities would depend heavily upon the war production of such factories. The next photograph shows a visiting royal party continuing their walk about to the various production departments with a workforce and staff looking on. The talents of Albert Peters were put to good use during the war period when he painted the morale boosting posters in aid of the war effort. This poster depicting the tank Darlington 10. Town hall dances were intended to raise the spirits of the townspeople and raise money for the soldiers' comfort funds. On this Albert Peters poster, the woman holding the child was modelled on Albert's wife and daughter. The Salute the Soldier Week poster, featuring General Montgomery, was erected outside the town hall, with the creator, Albert Peters, standing below it on the town hall steps. A photograph of this poster was sent to the Field Marshal Montgomery, which he signed and returned to Darleston. A copy of the same photograph was also sent to General Eisenhower, who did likewise. <music> Leslie Taff at the Compton Organ. As resident organist of the Regal Cinema, Leslie played at many functions and broadcast his music on BBC radio programmes during and later after the war. This ticket gave admission to the Regal Cinema for a musical evening given by Leslie Taff in aid of the Darleston Comforts Fund and followed his broadcast to the forces. A programme of events for Salute the Soldier Week, as shown here, was available at a price of sixpence. The programme gave details of the parade and all other activities with the aim of raising funds for the troops. The Regal Cinema was the venue for a grand variety show in aid of the Duke of Gloucester's Fund for the Red Cross and St John Associations as part of the Staffordshire Joint War Organisation appeal. Colonel Killian presented Let's Be Buddies, a GI musical review provided by American forces as part of this Anglo-American variety show, which included Fred Emney with Eva and Margaret French. During the somewhat inclement weather of the 14th of January, 1943, the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester visited the Ruby Owen Works, where they were received by the Owen family. Alfred Owen greets the Duke with Ernest Stone and the Duchess looking on. This visit was part of a big event in Darleston, which included a street parade by the military with support from all of the organisations of the town. A visit to the works nursery, where nursing staff provided childcare for the children of the working mothers who had taken on many of the jobs of the men drafted into the armed forces. Here we see the Works Fire Brigade and nursing staff being paraded ready for inspection and presentation to the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester. The visitors accompanied by A.G. Bowing viewing the Balfour's gun section. The Ruby Owen Works produced many items for the war effort, including aircraft wings, bomb cases, steel helmets and the many special fixings used in the aircraft industry. HMS Charleston was adopted by the citizens of Darleston during Warship Week in February 1942. This picture can be seen on display in Darleston Town Hall. This is the plaque commemorating the adoption of the destroyer HMS Charleston and is also on display in the Town Hall. William Walters, better known as Billy Muggins, was one of the town's best known characters, plying his trade as a scrap metal merchant before, during and after World War II. This Albert Peters poster was displayed on the gateway to Victoria Park for one of the many scrap drives launched throughout the country. Generations of the locals had seen him pushing his handcart around the town and calling out, 
Got any missus or hope it do rain? An invitation to relieve you of any old discarded metal items while sympathising with anyone having chose to do outdoors. Instead of a battered old bugle to announce his presence, or even at the behest of a passerby to rip one, Bill would blow a thunderous raspberry which would reverberate along the streets, much to the amusement of most of the passers-by, particularly the youngsters. The well-executed raspberry was one of the normal responses to the German and Italian wartime propaganda, and has always been an effective put-down when used against the pompous. The end of World War II hostilities witnessed great celebrations the length and breadth of the country. Huge bonfires were lit with effigies of Hitler on top, replacing the usual bonfire adornment of Guy Fawkes. The boisterous street parties went on late into the night with much singing, dancing and drinking.